I'm going to talk about implementing languages, um, which, is a, which is quite an overwhelming topic if you have no idea about it, and even more so if you have no idea about it and you actually have to tell other people about it. Um, before I get too in-depth into code, uh, I want to thank a couple of people. So first, I'd like to thank FluentConf. I only see one uh, FluentConf person around here. Um, but I'm sure you'll agree with me, the food's been great, the venue's great, and the talks so far that I've been to have been fantastic, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of this conference. So thanks for Fluent for having me. Uh, also, I'd like to thank Silverstripe. I work at Silverstripe in very far away in windy Wellington, New Zealand. I've traveled a long way to get here. And Silverstripe uh, is a company there that does some consulting, but also maintains an open source framework and CMS called Silverstripe, mostly written in PHP and JavaScript. And actually, the work that I do there is more on the open source side and predominantly in PHP, not so much JavaScript. I do enjoy doing JavaScript, and obviously, I must enjoy it to some degree to want to speak to so many people about it, um, despite overwhelming nervous nervousness. But um, I want to thank them for giving me the time to do this. And the reason I point this out, apart from thanking them, is to let you know that the stuff I'm going to talk about can be done in other languages. It's actually the concepts that you're going to learn that are important and portable to other languages. So I assume most of you are developers. And because of the nature of the conference, probably most of you are JavaScript developers. But if JavaScript's not your primary language or you prefer another one, you can actually do this stuff in that language. You'll see how and why. The syntax will obviously differ from language to language, but the ideas remain. And that's a good lead up to, I am not a special snowflake. You've come here because you want to learn about creating a compiler or creating an interpreter, or for many other reasons that doing these things are a good idea. But I'm not special in this regard. I haven't gone to compiler school. I haven't studied compiler theory at university. I haven't even gone to university. The things that I'm going to tell you, I've learned just by reading books and experimenting. And if you get nothing out of this, I want you to go away from here being excited to experiment. That's what this is about. So you may not consider yourself an expert, and you may think I am, and I'm not. But I want you to be excited about these ideas and to experiment with them, to play around with them, to learn, first and foremost. So don't think I'm special. I'm not. You'll see why. This also gets me to why compilers aren't actually important. It's interesting because we use them every day to run our JavaScript or to run our PHP or to run our Ruby. But the compilers themselves don't actually matter. Not nearly as much as the community around the language that we work in, the documentation for the language and for the various libraries we use every day, and the tooling to be able to develop in them. I'll give you a really good example of this. How many of you have used CoffeeScript, just by show of hands, or know something about it? CoffeeScript, OK. CoffeeScript is a white space significant JavaScript-ish like language, which in most cases compiles to JavaScript. It kind of resembles Python, if you've had any exposure to that, in that spaces matter in terms of variable scope and in terms of the structure of the language. But the first CoffeeScript compiler, many would argue, was pretty bad. It was slow. It was written in JavaScript, perhaps not written by a compiler expert. And that didn't actually matter, because there was tooling for CoffeeScript, syntax highlighting, code completion. It worked with IDEs. And sooner or later, the debugging tools got really good with it. There was a community around it, people who used it and built libraries for it and in it. So you could get things that were made to work with CoffeeScript and that helped you write better CoffeeScript programs. And the documentation is great. So now that it's there, it's really, really popular. And there have been many attempts to rewrite the compiler to be more efficient, to be faster, to be more clever. And those are great. But in the beginning, the compiler didn't actually matter that much. And when you're thinking of a language, it's important that you realize whatever you make as a first attempt to make a compiler, it doesn't have to be the fastest. It doesn't have to be the most clever. Because that's not going to matter as much as how easy you make it for people to use your language. How willing you are to do syntax highlighting or to do good documentation or to try and rope people in to make libraries to use your language. Those are the things that really matter. So get the idea for the language you want in your head and bear that in mind. And realize that you don't need to actually stress that much about making the fastest compiler out the gate, because that's not really that important. Now, I mentioned 
that I read a lot of stuff to get to the concepts that I'm going to show you, and there are two really good books I'd like to recommend you read if this stuff interests you. The first is by Martin Fowler called Domain Specific Languages. Uh, I'm going to refer to this as DSLs uh, going on. And though this isn't exactly a book about writing a compiler, a lot of the underpinnings of why you would want to make a DSL, why it's good, and how you would go about deciding on the specifics of it are outlined in this book, and it's a really good read. We'll also see that DSLs are a step short of general purpose programming languages, and I'll give you some examples as we go along. But this is a really good book to read. Even if you don't want to make a compiler, this is still a good book to read. The second one is Understanding Computation. This is a fascinating book, and it's got almost nothing to do with compilers. But it explains how we got from the beginnings of computation all the way back at Turing to now, what computers are doing underneath, how state machines work. It's a really, really great read as well, even if you don't go ahead to build a full compiler. So why is this useful? Why would it be useful for you to make a compiler? Uh, you can get a very good understanding of this by reading um, Fowler's book, but the reasons that I think are important for this uh, are the following. For one, you can improve your productivity. Maybe your application or your company does something quite specific to code that leads to a lot of boilerplate. Maybe every time you use a JavaScript getter, you actually log to a file to say, this value has been gotten, you know, which would be weird, but maybe you have to do that for your application or your company. And so you find that the language and that the boilerplate involved in using that language get in the way of your productivity. Maybe you can make a DSL or a programming language, the comp compiler for which I'm going to show you how to do. Maybe you can make those and actually be more productive because you can eliminate a lot of boilerplate and you can do things implicitly. Maybe the structure of your language feeds into improving your productivity just because of how your application works. Another useful thing for languages is that they create a common domain language between you and your clients. Say you're working on a banking application. Some concepts, some terms that the bank might use to describe transactions or clients or accounts may be different to the language you use because the language you use is based on the underlying framework or JavaScript itself. And so you could use a DSL as a way of bridging that gap, of defining your programming in terms that your client, your domain expert, the application you're building, in terms of those things so that you share a common language with anyone who could feed into the creation of the application you're working with. Then, another good reason is for alternative computational models. Uh, put up your hand if you've used Lisp. A few people. Put up your hand if you've used Go. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, the reason why these things are interesting is because if you've done predominantly JavaScript and you move to a language like Lisp, you have to work in some Lisp code. The structure of a Lisp application is vastly different to the structure that you're used to from JavaScript. In Lisp, everything's a list, and a lot of the programming constructs are lists, and lists everywhere, and lists all the things. And so moving from a prototypical inheritance, partially object-oriented language to a language like Lisp is a big fundamental shift. And so some applications, of using, some applications just are better if you're using Lisp, and some are better if you're using JavaScript. But the fundamental computational model is different. So maybe the applications you're writing could benefit from a different computational model. Maybe one chap has used Go, and the, um, the asynchronous primitives in JavaScript, especially ES7, are actually quite different from the concurrency primitives in Go. You know, you have coroutines and things in Go which you don't necessarily have in JavaScript unless you emulate them, and so those computational models are different. You can make a compiler to express a language that will create a new computational model, and so that's a good reason to do. But a reason that's not up there and probably my favorite reason for doing anything ever is to learn. You don't actually have to use a compiler you write or a language you create in production. You don't have to. You can use this as a means to just 
spend some time learning about how those things work behind the scenes. And maybe it'll give you a better idea of what those compilers are actually doing and ways that you can change your code in a popular compiler to be more efficient, just because of how they work underneath. So, what are some of the tools you can use to make compilers? One very good option is to use a compiler generator, but this, is an op this isn't an option that interests me very much. When you use a compiler generator, you use a specific DSL to express your programming language that you want to make a compiler for in a, in a language that the generator itself understands. Maybe it's using regular expressions, maybe it's using whatever it's using. You do your language in a set of rules that the generator understands, in a specific language that's usually unique to the generator itself. Now we'll look at an example right at the end of doing something like this, and it can be interesting, but if you go straight to this, you jump over the entire how a compiler works part of this learning. And I think that's actually more fascinating and more useful. So another tool you can use is just string manipulation and state machines, pattern matching as well. Uh, but I apparently forgot to put that on the slide. So string manipulation and state machines, these are functions you use to do normal stuff. I heard JavaScript once described as just a really increasingly complex way of concatenating strings on the internet. And so uh, the kinds of things that you do in everyday programs, um, like matching reg regular expressions, like combining strings, like creating instances of objects, these are all things you can use to make a compiler. And they'll help you understand what compilers are roughly doing underneath. This is more interesting, and a lot of the time we're going to spend is just on this stuff, which is cool. Now, in my infinite creativity, I have constructed a language that is entirely this. This doesn't actually exist, though it looks a bit like C-sharp or Java or whatever you want to do. The language I want to make a compiler for is summed up just in this. And it's kind of important to note that you're in a talk about implementing languages, not thinking them up. There is a very clear distinction between conceiving a language, what the syntax and what the structure is, imagining what you want to do as one side of things, and then building a compiler or interpreter as the other, other side of things. I need some water. OK, so we're here to implement. We're not here to uh, create a whole new language, though this is the one that I've picked for now. So, where do we start? We can start with grammar. How do we describe this as a set of rules so that we can start building a compiler for this? Grammar is two things, I think. Um, it's a list of rules that define the structure and the syntax of a language. So syntax being whether your language has curly braces, whether it ends in semicolons, whether it has significant white space or requires five spaces between each keyword, that's syntax. Structure becomes about whether your language supports nesting, how your variables are scoped. So grammar defines a lot of how these things work. And each rule in this grammar is called a lexeme, in case you come across this when you're doing further research after the workshop and that word uh, seems out of place, each rule in a list of grammar is a lexeme. We can try and define our language as everything in this language can be an expression. And the expression can be a type of a variable, the name of the variable equals, and then the value of a variable. Or we could say the last two bits are optional, uh, we're just actually doing type and variable name, and that's enough for a definition. This helps us to plan out how the different parts of our interpreter or compiler are supposed to work. And it's also useful to know this stuff for when we get right to the end for parser expression grammar, or just compiler generators in general, because they'll require rules like these in the special DSL that I mentioned. Then we feed this to a lexer. And a lexer, again, has a very special, is a very special step. It's got a very special thing that it's supposed to do. It takes a string of code, like if you got the contents of a file of code, and splits it into significant bits called tokens. 
It's basically going to give you an array of tokens. But what it's not going to do is concern itself with nesting or structure so much. It's actually just going to break bits of source code up into things that it thinks are significant. And at the same time, tell what type of things those are. So what we're looking to get out of Alexa is to say, OK, if this is a rule of grammar that I've got in my language, what I want is an array of the significant bits of it. Taking the original string of code, I want to work out that the first thing is a type, which has a value of int, the variable name, the assignment, and the value that we're assigning to that variable. And we're actually going to build this in code. So who of you are connected to the Wi-Fi? Who of you are not, sorry, I should say? Is anyone not connected to Wi-Fi? OK, so it's the network name is Fluent, and the password is fluentconf, all lowercase. Woo, can never use that password again. Um, connect to the Wi-Fi. What we're going to do is we're going to go to a website called JSBin, which is a really great place to prototype stuff. And I'm going to open, you can't see the contrast on the site, but I'm going to open the JavaScript and the console tab and close everything else. So we can start to write JavaScript on the left-hand side and see the results of that in the console on the right-hand side. I'll just make the console a little bit smaller. Another great thing that this website supports, which is one of the reasons that I'm using it to demonstrate this stuff to you now and for you to work through, is you can click on this JavaScript button up here and you can go to ES6 Babel which is a way for us to use very modern JavaScript syntax and for it to be compatible with popular browsers. This is going to convert ES6 code, which is modern JavaScript, into ES5 code, which is very commonly available JavaScript. OK? Everyone here? Remember, you can always ask questions, or you can you know, just put your hand up or just shout out. Uh, so if you click up here, there is a JavaScript tab. Cool. So the first thing... Uh, that's done automatically. You don't have to put that in. You just go to js jsbin.com. Okay, so click on the uh, HTML tab up here to hide it, and click on the JavaScript tab to show that. and then just change that JavaScript to ES6. Right. So first up, we're going to build a lexer. Uh, now, modern JavaScript supports the ability to emulate classes. So I'll use a class for this. I'll just say class lexer. And then how I intend to use this is to say, let me make this a little bit bigger. How I intend to use this is to say, let lowercase lexer is new Lexer, this is how we create an instance of classes in JavaScript. I should probably say I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the specific features of ES6, but if you want to learn about them, uh, in hindsight, you can go to Babel, <laughs> wow, my spelling, js.io. <laughs> there you go. Right, you can go here. Uh, there's a tab for Learn ES 2015. And this explains all of the things that are new on top of JavaScript you're probably already familiar with. OK, that's a good place to learn. Babeljs.io. Right, so back to JSBin. The way that we want to use this class is to say, create a new lexer. And the result we want to get is to run some code through lexer, through an analyze method, I'll say. And the code for the example language we're using is just int minutes is 90. You can put any numeric value in here. That should be fine. And then we'll just console log this result. OK. Now let's make sure that everything's working up to this point. We can have our analyze function, which accepts some code, and just a default empty string. And let's return this code just to make sure everything's working. By the way. Um, you can save the state of this code by command S or I guess control S if anyone on Windows can confirm that. If you do that, it should actually change the URL to reflect that your change has been made. But it also means that when you click run here, 
the latest version of the code on the left-hand side will be run on the right-hand side. Okay, everyone's seeing this. Who's not seeing this? All good? Okay. Now, ES6 gives us the ability to do getters, which means we can programmatically work out what the value of a property of an object is. Because we're creating a language and we've got a grammar that we want to work out in this language, this is a good time to start defining some patterns for what aspects of that grammar look like. So I'm going to make a getter here, the syntax of which is just get and then the name of the property. I want to determine programmatically. And then from that, I'm going to return an object with a few patterns that are significant to the rules of the language I'm making. Okay, the things that I'll return here, let's define some patterns. Um, the source code that I've got down at the bottom, well, it's got spaces in, so I want to firstly try and capture white spaces. So I'll make a rule that says white space. And then I'll make a partial regular expression pattern. Partial, we'll see why in a little bit. But in regular expressions, you have access to this thing slash s, which basically means white space. So space characters, tabs, carriage returns, new lines, all of that's white space. And in regular expressions, you can just use slash s. I have to escape the one slash because of how we make the regex, which you'll see. But slash s for white space in regex. And the plus means one or more. So in my language, I'm going to be able to have one space or two spaces or three spaces or a tab between elements of it, and that's not going to break the interpreter. OK, white space is the first thing. Then I want to match types, because int is a type. So I'll say types are defined as int. If my language supported more things, I could put a pipe here and say string or bool. But for now, I'm just going to do int. OK, that's all the types my language supports for now. And that's recognized by the string type. Then I think I'll do a sign as the next character. So that's just this character down here that I want to match as a pattern. Uh, I'll do identity, so variable names. And I'll define these quite simply for the moment, just lowercase alpha characters of any length. I'll say, are a variable. And then lastly, something for value. Now, again, I only have one data type here, so the expression for this is quite straightforward. But if I had Boolean, for instance, I could do pipe and just the string true, uh, true or false or whatever. For now, I'm just going to do numbers. OK. Now, you access these by saying this patterns. And because we've defined this syntax, it maps patterns to the results of this function. So if we, re we return that from the analyze method, which is being console logged at the bottom here, we should see that list of patterns that we want to match. All good? Questions? Anyone stuck? So how do we start to analyze this? Well, what we want out of Alexa is a list of tokens. So we can say let tokens is that list, which is empty for now. And at the end, we want to return tokens. In fact, kind of what I want to do actually is return both the tokens that we have and the source code that's left for reasons that will become obvious. So tokens and code. Again, this is some ES6 syntax. Basically, what this will return to us is an object where the key is tokens and the value is whatever that tokens variable is. And the key is code, and the value is whatever that code variable is. As a side note, I'm just going to make a new window from this and align it here. You can go to this babeljs.io site and go to try it out, and that will give you a side-by-side -side ES6 and ES5 window. So you can try this out. Maybe you can say, let code is a string, let tokens is a list, let result is an object of code, tokens with a trailing comma, 
And this is the ES5 code that will be generated alongside it. Very small. But you get the idea, right? If you're learning ES6 stuff, this is actually a really good way to learn it because you can write the code in ES6 that you learn on Babel.js and you can see what it compiles to in ES5. All right, so back to our lexer. We've got patterns. We return at the end the tokens that's identified and the code that's remaining. How do we start to tokenize this? Well, a good place to start is to have a loop. <laughs> so for let key in this patterns. OK. Now, we need to take the partial regex patterns that we defined in the getter and make actual reg regular expressions out of them. So we can say let pattern is new reg exp, which I always forget the p at the end there. And then we're going to say, OK, match from the start of the string and capture whatever is in the pattern. This patterns with key. I'll put this on a new line so the formatting is clear. OK. Let's see what this generates. Console log pattern to string. Oh, that doesn't look right. There we go. OK. Must remember to command save. Right, so for each partial regular expression, we now create a new regular expression that will match source code in our source. OK? And for each of these, we'll actually return what it did match, because it's important to know that when we get to later stages of this whole thing. Are there any questions so far? Please do shout out if there are. OK. Now we didn't match some source code. We'll say matches is code match pattern. And if we have matches, console log the pattern that got them and the match. Because we're capturing groups, we're going to get, for every successful match, we're actually going to get two elements. The first is the complete string that was matched, and the second, third, fourth, and fifth are the, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for, the capture groups, so everything in between sets of brackets. So we get the matches by matching regular expression patterns on the source code. And if we have matches, tell us what they are. OK. So this has successfully matched the int keyword, but it's matched it twice. And it's doing that because every time we see a match, what we actually need to do is reduce the source code that is still left to analyze. We've worked out that we have a valid token here. We have a type definition, and its value is int. So we can push a new token onto this list to say the type of token it is and the value that was matched. And then we also just need to modify the code to remove that thing that was matched so that we can keep stepping through the code. We'll say something like code uh, Code is code substring. So now it just takes the rest of the code after the match that it's done. OK. Right, now if we run this, Err, save. I'm doing something wrong here. <laughs> code is code substring following the matches. Let me have a look at my backup. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Matches.length. That's actually what we need to do. So this, the code that we have left is actually all the code starting after the bit that we matched. When we run this, there we go. It's pulled out the first token, a type definition, the value of which is int. 
And the rest of the code remaining is minutes equals 90. And it's done that because we only go through the patterns once. What we actually need to do is go through all the source code until there's none left, or until we can't pass anything more. We do that with an infinite loop, like this. That's sort of infinite. The trouble with doing a while true loop is that if we get to something that we can't parse, this is never going to stop. Uh, so how we get around that is to have a variable which is length for the length of the code. And then we run through all the patterns. And afterwards, if the length is still the same, then we've either processed all the code we can and done an extra cycle, or we've gotten to a bit of code that we can't actually interpret. And so here we can just break out of this loop. When we run this, now we have no code left, and we've got an array of tokens matching all of our source code. So these are the important bits for the rest of our compiler to get along with. You're right there. <laughs> OK. Is everyone with me so far? Yeah, sure. I'll actually zoom out a little bit so you can see more of the code on the screen at the same time. Uh, I'm going to add to this as we go through the talk, and then I'll put all of this on GitHub. Uh, I'll have, uh, you, can, you can follow me on Twitter, at assert Chris, and I'll post links there. You can go to the conference website. There's a link later on in the slides. And you can go there, and I'll put a link there. Um, if none of those work, just come ask me, and I'll give you a link afterwards. I don't want to put it on yet, because we may add to this as the talk goes on based on questions and stuff. But I will put it somewhere. Good question. Everyone with me? Any other questions? Put your hand up when you think I can carry on with the presentation. After like three or four hands, I'll carry on. One hand, two hands. Three hands. OK, more hands. Uh, if you still want this code afterwards, come ask me. Come check out the links, as I mentioned. Uh, or talk to me in the conference. I'm happy to waffle on about this for hours. <laughs> okay. So now we've done it. We've taken the rules of our language, admittedly a simple language, and we've pulled out of some source code the significant portions that we call tokens that we can start to do more interesting programming things with. The next step is to make a parser. Now, a parser takes the unidimensional array of tokens we've got, and it starts to arrange these things in hierarchies. So just as we said, Every expression of our language can be a definition. Definition is actually an important word to us. We can make an array that says some syntax is a definition. We can make a class that says this is a definition and it has these properties. And a parser is also a good place to start to check for syntax errors. What we want out of the code that we're about to write is to take that first array that we got of tokens You'll notice it's actually missing the white space tokens because I don't really care about those. And to give us a definition of what this assignment is. So what's the type of the variable that's being assigned? What's its name? What's its value? OK. Let's do that in code. You can carry on in the same JSBin window. I'm going to go to a separate one to avoid some extra scrolling. But what I am going to do is I'm going to take this list of tokens that we began with in our console. Oh, sorry. Yes, hold on a second. Let me format it quickly, and then I'll share it. OK. Let tokens is this list. And I'll just do some indentations so that it's not super ugh. OK. 
and I'll put that on guest, just whatever you like. And that is a very long link. <laughs> hey? Yeah. Group coding is the best. The, the previous one. Sure. Okay. This one. I'm happy about this. Okay. I'll put this here. Oh. That's not good. It's not going to like shortening all that code. Okay. Bit.ly forward slash one W seven six A Q A. It's not very high contrast, but anyway. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, sure. One W seven six capital A, capital Q, capital A. I'll put all the slides and the code on GitHub later as well, if you want to go back through it. And these talks are being recorded, so ask someone at O'Reilly about that. OK. Given a starting point of the tokens we got from our Lexo, how do we start to put these into a parser? I'll make a parser class. And the way that I expect to use this is to say, let an instance of parser be a new parser. Oh. Let the result be that of parser analyze, the list of tokens, and console log what that result is. I'm missing assignment. There you go. OK. Make a new parser, get the results of the analyze method, and console log those results. OK. Now, we've said we need an analyze method, so let's make it. It takes in a list of tokens, which will just default to an empty list. And now, what I want to do is I want to start saying, OK, I've got this unidimensional list, but I want to create a bit of structure, a bit of hierarchy. I know that my language just consists of definitions, so it's kind of a boring language, but I can take a number of tokens and convert it to a single statement, if you like, a single construct. And so to do that, I will loop through these tokens. For var i, ooh, let i. Just a normal for loop with some syntax errors. <laughs> OK, so for each token, I want to start adding some logic. I want to start making my parser interesting. So what I'll do is I'll analyze to see what kind of token it is that I'm working with. If tokens i, oh, if the type of tokens i is a sign. So if it sees an, an equal symbol, what does it do then? Well, this is kind of an indication that a value is being assigned to a variable. I can inspect the tokens before and after and start to create a bit of structure. I can say something like, uh, I can say something like tokens splice. Starting a couple tokens back. In fact, no, I'm jumping ahead a bit here. I'm jumping ahead a bit here. If we see an equal symbol, we want to make sure that it's a valid assignment that's happening, a valid definition. And in order for that to happen, remember back to the syntax that we start with, which I'll put in a comment here, int minutes equals 90. In order for this to be a, be a valid statement, the equals has to see a type definition two tokens back. So oh. if we've traveled at least three tokens forward, if i is greater than 2. I think I can actually do i is greater than 1 in this case. So if we've traveled at least two tokens forward, and the token 2 back 
is a type definition, then we know this is valid. I'll break this rule in a little bit and then you can see how this actually fails. But this is interesting to us. We need to see that an equal symbol is preceded by a couple tokens, one of which is a type definition and the other of which is the variable name. So, Uh, no, I shouldn't, and you're, that's a very good question. Because remember I said earlier I don't actually care about the white space tokens? We can remove those by just saying tokens is tokens.map, uh, tokens.filter, to return every token that is not a white space. Oh, <laughs> hilarious typo, white space. <laughs> okay. Make it a little bit smaller. Okay, so tokens is all the tokens that are not white space characters. That was a very good question and you saved me some debugging. If we actually return this list quickly, uh, return tokens, we can see what this new list looks like. Uh, token is not defined. <laughs> That's interesting. Sorry? Oh. <gasps> Thank you. Uh, no, that's right. This is, this is actually right. No, it was down here. I was missing an S. Um, so this is ES6 uh, arrow syntax. It's essentially the same as saying tokens is tokens filter with a function, token return token not equal to white space. It's actually just some shorthand for that, which is pretty cool. That's why I like ES6 so much. Okay, so we know this is working. Um, so when we get to this point, we're looking for an equals token that's preceded to back by a type, all right? So if we have that, we can actually replace this token The starting point is two tokens back. The number of tokens we're replacing is four in total. Type, variable name, equals, value. And what we're replacing it with is a definition. Uh, and the definition is tokens i minus two. We're actually just interested in the value of these, not their type anymore, because we know what their type is now. So i minus two i minus one, and i plus one. We don't actually care about the assignment symbol anymore, the assignment token, because we know by now this is a definition. We actually just care about the value of the type that was matched, the name of the variable that was matched, and the value of the value that we're assigning to that variable. Okay, so when we do this, uh, we've modified our token slightly. If we clear and we run, <laughs> undefined. That's because I'm not returning anything yet. So return tokens code. No, just tokens. Just return tokens. There we go. Until we get to this point where we're defining this logic, we'll just get the original tokens array. But this logic checks for an assignment and replaces all the parts of that assignment with a definition construct. And so now when we run it, we don't get the original tokens array. We get a definition and the values that are significant to that. What the type was, what the variable name is, what the value was. Now, if this is an invalid assignment, if this is an invalid definition, we can actually check for that. If we get to an equal symbol and we don't have a type right in the beginning, we can just throw a new error. And to see this breaking, let's just remove the type in the beginning. Error syntax error. So the parser is a great place to start doing some syntax checking for your language. I'll make it valid again and run it. 
and scroll up so you can see the code again. Okay. Is everyone here? Is everyone happy? You don't look happy. Would you like to move a little bit closer to see the screen? No, I'm just, I'm just looking at the I, I can't keep up the session, so I'm just okay. looking at it. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, anyone have any questions about this parser code? I think it'll just use, um, uh, so it pulls all the identifiers out in our Lexus step, so one class back. Uh, so there we would have two type definitions in a row. It would still be a problem because we're not checking against that here. And so we can start to add validation in here to cover those things. Uh, so back in, back in the regular expressions, you can actually define some flags for this. Uh, I don't remember the exact syntax that we're looking for here. Maybe it's I for case insensitive. Let's see. Let's run this. Okay, that still works. Let's change this to and run this. It still works. Sweet. So when you make your regular expressions to match this, you can just add that flag if you'd like. Back to the parser. Thank you. Good questions. Now, that being said, since you removed it out of here and you're going to bring it back up without that, where will we go to get all of the different flags that we can put on here? Later on? Like, if we didn't know about that I flag, where could we look and find, oh, here's how you can type My go to to find documentation on JavaScript for like anything ever is to type M, D, N, and the thing that I want syntax on. You see, I've typed a few of these already. But here you can say reg exp, and this will take you to the Mozilla developer docs, and all the things you want to find out about this you can find here. I think there's the i syntax there. So mdn space, whatever you want to search for, and any keywords bound to get you to the thing that you're looking for. This is an amazing resource. Good questions. Yes? you have a question? I saw a hand somewhere. <laughs> okay. Everyone happy with this? Can I carry on? Hands, please. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So um, if you're making something like the REPL that you see on babel.js.io or on JSBin where you can pick a number of different kinds of languages here, making a compiler in JavaScript is not perhaps the fastest language to do it in, but it's a way to transpile code in the browser without someone refreshing. Yeah. Yes. So that's also a very good point. Um, earlier when I spoke about DSLs as not being, 
I guess, fully general purpose programming languages. They're still very close, right? Uh, if you've used BB code in forum software, as an alternative to making image tags in a blog post or a forum post, you can use a kind of DSL to define those things, to define images or code or iframes or whatever. That's a perfect example of this because you don't necessarily want people to put HTML tags, like script tags, in a forum post, but you may want to allow them to embed images however they want. So yes, uh, using it as a DSL is, is a very good use for this. 